sorry about the delay. Welcome back to Free Read Fridays. I'm your intrepid narrator, Fragath, and today we're reading some more Heavy Time by C.J. Cherry. Previously on, we had a pretty important breakdown um, by Meg Katie uh, to Sal Abujib about kind of the difference between people who are currently out there in the asteroid, work in the asteroid belt, and people on Earth. Um, it's a number of socio-cultural differences, um, and a lot of those differences are a result of uh, Aztecs. No, no, not those Aztecs. Uh, the other ones. Um, Asteroid explor explorations or exploitations. Um, the company that basically owns uh, the <laughs> the operations around the asteroid belt, um, where our characters are. Uh, so corporate interference changing human behavior. Um, also things like not having air just there <laughs> like you have to import air so things are different values because different things are precious that you take for granted on earth that just aren't something you can take for granted there in the belt um so between that you also had uh meg katie's plan to try and get decker uh, a, do Decker a bit of a favor of sorts, even though they did basically take the ship from him. Uh, they being Ben, Pollard, Maury Bird, Meg Katie, and Sal Abujib. Although Meg and Sal are less directly taking the ship from him and uh, more trying to get Bird and Ben to let them use one of them. Basically, their plan uh, is to help Decker get his license back by bringing him out to get board time on the ship, which is something you can't ordinarily do all that easily uh, because his license has been revoked due to, uh, I guess, criminal incompetence. Um, well, just negligence, incompetence, and everything that happened. Uh, he was non compass mentis when they got him in, so there you have it. They took it away. So he, at least he won't be going out into space, but now they're going to try and help him get it back. Uh, there's only one tiny problem. Decker's not exactly all there. <laughs> like, the boy's got some serious issues. So, them taking him out there is not, on their own, some is kind of a sticking point with Bird and Ben, um, and in fact with them, <laughs> with, with, with Meg and Sal. They're not exactly thrilled. But, they'd be helping him, and then all the while he'd basically be free labor for all intents and purposes. Uh, they'd like be paying for room and board, but that's about it. Um, otherwise he's, you know, <laughs> he's an extra set of hands working on his own ship that he was already working on. So, hmm. They're screwing him, but they're also helping him at the same time. Mm, well, they're screwing him as, well, that might happen too. Well, he, because he's presumably a good looking boy. So yeah. Um, we're about two-thirds going on three-quarters of the way through the book. Uh, let me just really quick check to see how long the next couple chapters are, see how much I can get done. Um, this week will probably be another short-ish one. I can do that. Two chapters, 12 to 13. Uh, all this while as well, um, we've been hearing references to the shepherds. Uh, I think think we learn more about them as we go. The most we know really right now, I think, is that they're, uh, for lack of a better term, they're like a union, um, which, of course, the corpse, the corpos don't, don't especially like. Um, they aren't really the same thing. Uh, what they are, in effect, uh, is, and I think this is explained, um, they're kind of like what goes on 
on some of these longer run spaceships that in this universe that go out and basically become a family operation. Um, I think that's what's going on with the Shepherds, but it's been a while, so I don't remember. Um, there's a couple books that are set in this universe that I'd really like to get around reading because they're very fascinating and how, oh, just, just kind of the way uh, human behavior would change. Um, some of the ideas of, of human behavior changing and a few other things that are really neat. Um, there's a, I mean, uh, once I start, it's hard to stop. Like right now I'm setting myself, okay, get through this, get, do something in between this and then Hellburner. Um, so two books that really kind of help set the stage, the build up to um, the actual events of Down Below Station. I don't know if I'll ever get to Down Below Station. That that book's an undertaking. Uh, there's a lot there. All right, um, I've yabbered long enough. Uh, let me get cracking here, and uh, we'll see what we got. Chapter 12 Decker drowsed in the muted music noise of the bar outside, lay in a .9G bed half awake, having convinced himself that there wasn't anybody going to come through the door with hypos or tests or accusations. That was all the ambition he had. He was safe in this place, and maybe if he just stayed very quiet, there wasn't going to be anybody interested in him for a while, including Bird and including Ben. Please, God. He got hungry, and hungrier. Breakfast hadn't been much. Finally, he looked at his watch, just looked at it a while. Didn't know the right hour. Bird had told him it had been off. But it was August 16th. It stayed August 16th. He knew where he'd gone off, and how absolutely unhinged he'd come. Would never have thought he was capable of going off that far. Would have hoped better of himself, at least. He'd kept a sort of routine on the ship once he'd slowed the tumble with the docking jets, enough to move about a little, do necessary things. Irrational things, he thought now. Some of them completely inane, because Corey would have. God, he'd nearly killed himself doing housekeeping routines. Because Corey would have. He wasn't sure how much he'd forgotten. There were some holes he never seemed likely to patch. Other memories weren't in any kind of order. He was scared to try to sort them, afraid he'd find some other memory to leap up and... to leap up and grab him by the throat. Like that damned flash on the shower wall, the watch. He couldn't even remember if he'd had a shower the day of the accident. No, he thought, there'd been too much going on. Hole there deep hole. Scary one. His heart was thumping. It was just the green wall, the place aboard Bird's ship that looked exactly like his own. That was where he'd gotten lost, but there were so many other places. The bar outside, the deck, the people he didn't know. He was hungry, and he didn't want to go out and face people and questions and strangers. So he lay still a long while and listened to the beat of the music and finally took his pills when he figured it must be time. Then his stomach began to be upset in earnest. He figured he should go get something to eat to cushion the pills, so he ventured out as far as the bar. No one out there that he remembered but the owner, who didn't meet him with any friendliness. No, they didn't serve lunch. There were chips. Dollar fifty a package. Want any? He took a package and a soft drink. Wanted them on his card, but the owner said he was on birds and wouldn't take no. He didn't want to fight. He took his card back and moused back to his room, upset. He didn't know why, except he didn't know what the terms were, or why he was, so, why he was too scared to demand the damn chips go on his card. But he was, and he was ashamed of himself. He ate the chips with a lump in his throat, sat there on the bed and thought about taking a sleeping pill and just numbing out for a few hours, because he'd been dislocated out there. Nothing and no one out there was familiar. 
He couldn't sit here and go around and around in mental circles all day. He hadn't the routines that kept him sane. He was sitting here waiting for something he didn't know what, and he couldn't keep out of mental loops. He took out the sack of pills, looked at the size of the bottle that was sleeping pills. God, he thought, what are they doing? How many of these are there? In which curiosity, he poured the pills out on the counter and counted them. 212 pills. Didn't intend for me to want refills on that one for a while. He might be a little micro-focused. He tended to do that lately. Maybe it was brain damage. But his amusements had gotten very narrow in hospital. Bitter, constant harassment. Move and counter. They moved. You moved. You didn't trust them. They never made consistent sense. He spilled pills out onto the nightstand and started counting. Vitamin pills. Potassium. Thirty or so each. The calcitropin stuff, enough for a month. Big bottle labeled, Stomach Distress. As needed. Another labeled, For Pain. One every four hours. Forty of those. Decongestant. Forty-five pills. One every four hours. Diuretic. Sixty pills. One daily. Drink plenty of liquid. Anti-inflammatory. Forty pills. Take two before meals. Depression. Sixty pills. Alcohol contraindicated. He sat there with those piles of pills, the one of them making this towering great heap on the counter, and he stared at it, and he stared, and he thought, 212 sleeping pills? What did they do? Misread the prescription? No, that's not it, is it? Corey's dead. They tell me I'm crazy. They take my ship and take my license and tell me I won't fly again, and they give me 60 uppers... And 212 sleeping pills? They really don't want me to screw up my exit. He hadn't known where he was going or what he was doing until he'd stared at that heap of pills a while. He thought, first they kill Corey. Then they want me dead. The hell with that. He raked the pills into the appropriate bottles, wondering if there was a way to get into the corporation level. No, that was crazy. Really crazy people went into places and killed people who didn't have anything to do with their problems. Some innocent little key pusher or some smooth corporate bastard, neither one was going to get to the people responsible. Somebody was outside. Somebody knocked on his door and a cold panic shot through him. Decker? Yeah, he said. Decker? A woman's voice. One of Bird's friends. He didn't know why his hands were shaking. He didn't know what he'd just been doing or thinking that deserved it. But his heart went double time, and reason had nothing to do with it. It's Meg Cady. You want to open the door? He raked the pill bottles into the plastic bag, the bag into the drawer. Not all of it fit. He made it. Decker? Severe spook, Sal had called him, and face to face with him, Meg was very much afraid Sal might be right. He opened the door a crack, listened with a dead, cold expression while she explained she and Sal wanted to buy him a drink. Thought you might be tired of the walls. Come on, get some air. Have a drink or two. He looked as if at any second he was going to slam that door and lock it in her face. Maybe with reason, Meg thought. The man must know Ben didn't like him, and he must, might have a real suspicion about the rest of Bird's friends. Hey, she said, and gave him her friendliest grin. You're not afraid of us. If that and the sweater she was wearing didn't get a man out of his room, she hadn't got a backup. Decker muttered under his breath, looked rattled, and felt over his pockets. This place to leave Satan... <laughs> <laughs> this place safe to leave stuff? Yeah, anybody boast stuff from the hall? He's Mike's breakfast sausage. How you feeling? All right. 
dead tone. All right. Decker came out, let his door lock, walked with her down the hall to the bar like he was primed and ready to jump. Severe spook. Yeah. Or suspicious of them and their motives. Sal was waiting. Easy to capture a table with space around it. Traffic at this hour was real light, most people being about their business. They went through the social dance. Hello there, good-looking. How are you feeling? Sal pulled a chair out, got up. He sat down. She sat down. Meg sat. Mike, thank God, got right over for the orders. Spiced rum? Decker asked. Eh, premium price, Mike said. Decker hesitated, reached for his card. Meg put a hand in the way. Let us buy. Upset him. He slowly put his card on the table. Put it on mine. All of it. Rum and whatever they're having. Meg shot a look at Sal, and gave Mike a shrug. What the man wants, she said, thinking, pricey tastes he's got. Mike took the card. Decker started to lean back, arm over the chair back, like it was a fortified corner he wasn't going to be pried out of, but the hand was shaking. He put it on the tabletop. Sal said, What do you go by? Deck to friends. Deck. Sal reached out across the table. Sal, Abujib, if you got to find me. He hesitated, then made a snatch forward and, slalom <laughs> and solemnly took Sal's hand. Meg reached hers out. My Greek Katie. Cold fingers, scared spitless. Meg'll page me anywhere. There's only one on R2. You been out of that room lately? Today? Whoops. You been out of that room today? Lunch, he said. Any good? He shrugged. Mike got the drinks over. Fast, thank God. A merciful few beats without conversation. Decker picked up his drink. Meg lifted her glass with a flourish. Welcome to R2, Deck. Thanks, he said faintly. Thanks for the drinks. You remember us at all? He nodded. Sal said, We better say, before anything else, we're the ones that have way out least. He didn't react at all to that, just kept looking at Sal. I'm the pilot, Meg said. Sal's my numbers man. You were the primary license on your team, right? Decker nodded glumly, watching them every move. He held the rum in one hand, the other arm over the chair. Yeah, I was. Excuse. She leaned her elbows on the table and cut down the distance. Let's be frank here. They busted your license. Bird and Ben claimed your ship, but they haven't cut you off cold either. They risked their financial asses saving your life. Understand? A lot of expenses. Yeah. So we got a lease on what used to be your ship, and probably you aren't real happy with us. Decker said tonelessly, Yeah, well, not your fault. No hard feelings. But, Sal butted in, we got to thinking how we could do you and us both some real good. Meg said quickly, We figure out, we figure you want your license reinstated, which you got to have board time for which could be expensive if you had to get it from the company, and you still might need some help to get past the bureaucrats. Decker gave her a quick, plain, a what-in-the-hell-are-you-up-to stare. Shilovec, she said quietly, because even in the bar, even with the music going, you had to worry about bugs lately, since the cops had searched the place. You ran into real trouble, got ground up in the gears entirely, you and your partner. Where are you from? Soul Station? Decker nodded. Neo out here? Two years. His jaw was set, not going to say a syllable more than he had to. Improvement on yesterday, she thought. Boot put, Deck, you got yourself into one hell of a mess, and there's buku guys on R2 who'd pick your pocket the rest of the way. But as happens, we're not them, and Bird's a blue skyer, so he knows where you come from. Not that we owe you, mind. But Bird doesn't like to take advantage. There's some things we can't fix. But suppose we could... But suppose we could. What's prime business on your mind right now? 
What can we do most for you? He shook his head, staring elsewhere. Mad. I don't blame you, Junfei. But are you going to spite yourself? What can we do to even things up? Anything you need? Another shake of the head. Yeah, well, you know what the corp rats want, don't you? That got a look. A nasty one. They want you all theirs, Junfei. They don't like the independence. Whoops. They really don't like the independence. Their charter makes them have to accept us, but they got you right down to signing with the company. They won't sign me with the company. I haven't got a license. Oh, they'll give it back to you, Junfei, when you're theirs. Aztec's regulations screwing you over and Asbank ready to lend you money. What are you running on now? Mind my asking? Yeah, I mind. Good. Do mind. But do you want to get that license without them? A little reaction there. Not a word. We got a deal for you. You get time at our boards, you take our help, you, me, Sal, Bird, and Ben, we all make our own little arrangement that gets you working again, gets you fed, boarded, and eventually reinstated. How's that? Interest at last. Hostility. Why, goodness of your heart, Rab? You pay us cash for our time if you can pay us, or you pay us a share plus lease after that. That's Bird's word on it, if you pass muster by Sal and me. He looked somewhere else. She let the silence hang there a moment, then said, We're not hard to get along with, Deck. We're fair good company. My partner's dead. Do you bloody mind? Sal said, She fond of you starving? Cold bitch, Junrab. Decker looked bloody death at her, but Sal sailed right on. But I guess she wasn't a cold bitch at that, and she wouldn't like what you're doing to yourself if she was here, which she isn't nor will be hereafter. She's signed off, man. We all do. Death's life, you know, and it keeps on. Shove off. Decker pushed his chair back and got up. Meg did, laid a hand on his arm. He slung it off. Mike, over at the bar, was probably reaching for the length of pipe he kept. She said, quietly, lifting both hands, Easy, easy. No cops here. No offense. Help here. That's all. You're an antique, you know it. You're a friggin' antique. Rab's gone. You're not in it anymore. She actually felt a painful spark of interest. The jeune fille more lately from Saul and more in the current. True? She tilted her head, took a damn you stance, and said, You got better, little plastic? He was twenty, maybe. You wouldn't tell it by the eyes, but the body, the way he let himself be jerked off course, scared as he was, that was all young fool. Maybe he, re maybe he didn't really even want to care about what she thought now. He'd only attack blind, young fool-like, and for just a single unquiet moment, knew she'd just attacked him back. Come out of it. It's the twenties. So? What's the twenties got to offer us the fifteen didn't? Corp rats in fancy suits? Here at R2, still the teens. Maybe I don't like your tomorrow, little corp rat. It's 2323 on Saul, and they're building warships to blow the human race to hell. Lot you changed. Whole fucking lot you changed. So what's the word, little plastic? The word's business suits. The word's grab it before it goes. That's Saul. That's all the good you did. Bitter news, no better than she already knew. But she balanced on the balls of her feet, hands in belt, shrugged, and said, It goes on, young Rab. Didn't we tell you back in the 15? Wake up. You're going to fly for them? I'm not flying for anybody. You'll be living off the corporate sandwich lines the rest of your life if you do the fool now. They'll own you. And you'll be flying some damn refinery pusher till you're older than Bird. She added quietly, gently, Or you can sit down, June Fee, listen to me, and use your brains for more than ballast. He stood there without saying anything. Meg thought, with Sal in the tail of her eye, God's sake, don't move, Abujib. Keep your friggin' mouth shut. Kid's going to blow if you draw breath. Decker looked away from her then, 
hooked a leg around his chair front, and melted down into it. Meg heaved a sigh, sank into the chair next to him, where he had to look her in the eyes. Let us make up, June Rab. Let's not do deal right now. Let's just take you out on the deck and show you the cheap shops. I don't feel like it. Not far. Relax. We're severely reprehensible, but we don't take advantage. Won't push you. Just a little walk. Kid was scared white, and he managed not to look her in the eyes. Come on, she said. You've seen too much of hospitals. Sal and I'd like to spend a little. See you get fixed up with a... Ugh. Sorry about that. <laughs> ah, here we go. <clears throat> Kid was scared white, and he managed not to look her in the eyes. Come on, she said. You've seen too much of hospitals. Sal and I'd like to spend a little. See you get fixed up with a bit more friggin' plastic bag for Kit. Like to stand you a few personals, you copy? Even if you decide not to take the rest of our offer. She figured Sal was having a stomach attack right now, knowing Sal. Meg, Sal'd say, you want to pass out tracts, too? Decker's breathing grew calmer after a moment. He said, Shove off. You're telling us you want to go out, go with the company. We should leave you alone. Just stay out of your life? A few more breaths. He picked up the glass with a shaking hand, drained it, and set it down empty, except the ice. Then he nodded, and seemed to fall in on himself a little. Yeah, all right, whatever. Like they could chop him up in pieces if they wanted to. He didn't care. She put her hand on the back of his chair, stood up, and he stood up. She showed him toward the door with, Mike, tell Bide we're shopping. And Sal, damn her, with the nerve of a dock monkey, locked on to Decker's arm as they headed him, as they headed him out the door, saying, I know this place, absolute first rate. You got to see. All right? Clearly, I should have titled this chapter, Decker Goes Out. Medium, he told the dealer, embarrassed by his company, exhausted by the walk, not sure he wasn't going to be had in various ways, some possibly dangerous, but he couldn't prove it. He'd broken what Corey called Rule One, going off with belters he didn't at all know, into shops they did, they did know, taking their word about who to deal with and who to trust. He didn't know whether they were on Bird's side of things or not. Ben's, for all he knew, but they were having a good time and he was out of the funk he'd tried to sink into. Drifting a little, maybe. But they'd gotten him moving. They'd made him mad. But they'd done more for his nerves than all of Visconti's pills. He was alive. He was thinking about something besides Corey, overwhelmed with music, with colors and textures and excited, cheerful voices. He was halfway happy for a moment. Now, no shiz, Pat. You give him our deal now, Sal told the guy, whatever that meant, and Meg called after him. Now, Corporad, now, something serious. The dealer brought back pants and a bulky sweater. The pants said medium. They were gray stretch, and they didn't look ha they didn't half look medium. The price at forty nine ninety nine, middling high for a cheap shop. That's too much, he objected. The dealer whisked out another pair of pants with diagonal stripes, black and red, that looked like a rab's nightmare. Laid that out with a blue sweater. God, Meg said, not blue, red. Can you match? 
Let's try for coveralls, he said. Blue or gray? Something that fits. Ah, white stuff, Meg said. Dull, dull. No fun. Try the gray pants. Come on, Deck. You got the figure. Starvation, he muttered. He told himself he should stop this. Just get the coveralls traded for something that fit. But they were both set on him trying the gray. They shoved sweaters at him, and in their enthusiasm it was just easier to do it. Make a fool of himself and prove once for all it wasn't going to work. But the mirror showed him a walking rack of bones that actually didn't look bad in the pants, and that could use a sweater twice its useful size to hide his thin shoulders. He wasn't sure, though, about the big slash stripes on the sweater. He stepped out of the changing booth to get the dark blue one, self-conscious as all hell, and the women made appreciative sounds. Rab sweater, Meg said. Oh, I do like that. He suffered a crisis of judgment then, looking in the mirror outside the dressing booth, and before he could reorganize, Sal said, Suppose he'd fit those metal gray boots? He's got small feet. He didn't really want a wide-striped sweater. He hadn't set out to get metal gray boots that belonged to a prostitute. He damn sure didn't need the bracelet Sal shoved on him, but... This is my treat, Sal said. Man, you got to. Push the sleeves up. I need work clothes worse. Blue. On my card. He's trading in the coveralls, Meg said to the dealer. Can you just size him down? Yeah, the dealer said, and hauled out a pair that said small. If these don't fit, you can exchange. You're a real small medium. That wasn't what a man wanted to hear, who'd worked hard getting the s hard enough getting the size in the first place. But he decided he might be, after the hospital. He got the bracelet. He bought some cheap underwear and a pair of thermals, a plain gray stim suit, his old one having been washed to a rag. That was expensive, and he ended up with the blue sweater, too, along with a pair of black pants, stretch like the gray, and black docker's boots, used. He was tired now, dizzy and shaking in the knees. He was ready to go back to his room and collapse. The man was toting up the charge, and he felt a moment of cold panic as those numbers rolled up. He wasn't sure now what he'd just done. He wasn't even sure he dared wear what they'd talked him into. He'd had his turn with Rab when he was thirteen. But not here, where Rab was a statement he didn't know how to deal with, where it was corporate, or where it was a badge of things he didn't understand. I'm a fool, he thought. He thought how Bird and Ben were going to look at him when he got back, and the rest of the boarders at the hole, some of whom might take serious exception to a show-off with no license. He'd forgotten his troubles. They'd made him forget for a few dazed moments, and damned well set him up. I think we'd better get back, he said, wanting time to think. His head was going around. But Meg said, Nag, Nag, you can't go shaggy. Let's get that hair trimmed. Cut off that pretty hair, Sal said, the way he'd protested once himself, when he was thirteen. No, not all of it, Meg said. Come on, Deck, let's go get you fixed up. It's on the way. It won't take fifteen minutes. No, he said. Which ended him up in a barber's chair, dizzy and remembering he'd missed at least one batch of pills, with two women telling a Helldeck barber how he wasn't to take too much off. Except the sides, Meg said. He'd given up. It was like the hospital. He was just too tired to fight on his own behalf. And they were right. The shoulder-length hair and the shadows under his eyes made him look like a mental case. If the cut was too extreme, he could trim the top himself, with a packing knife or something. God, he didn't care right now. It was a place to sit down. Corey and he had cut each other's hair to save money. Conservative, Martian trim. Just practical. He watched what was happening in the mirror in front of him, and kept thinking, in the strobe of the barbershop neon, Corey wouldn't like this. Corey would get that disgusted, high-class look on her face and say, Really not your style, Deck. Corey's first letters had told him she didn't like the Rab. When she'd sent her picture, he'd realized he had to send his back, with the long hair and the wild colors, and, God, the gold earring, he'd forgotten that. 
but he'd been thirteen. He'd seen a serious, soft-eyed girl as sober and as kind as the letters. So, in another crisis of judgment, he'd gone to a barber and borrowed a plain blue pullover. Gotten a serious job. He'd forgotten that, too. Tried to hide it from his friends, but they'd found out and thought it was damned funny. He hadn't had those friends after that. Hadn't had many friends at all after that. Except Corey, and he'd never met her face to face. Stupid way to be. He hadn't planned it. He hadn't been happy with his school, his work, with anything but flying. Worked the small pushers for the shipyard. He was supposed to be loading them. The health and safety regs didn't let kids outside the dock there. But he'd got his class three, and the super let him sub in until he was subbing in for a guy that ran a pusher into a load of steel plate. Up the sides, Meg said. Yeah, yeah! Sal, with her metal-clipped braids, learned to get a direct look at him, leaned to get a direct look at him, flashed a white grin, and said, That's optimal. It didn't hurt a guy's feelings to have a couple of women saying he looked good, but what was developing in the mirror in front of him was someone he'd never met before. It was 2315 again, but he wasn't 11, he was 20. It was the way the Deep Spacer had said, the one they'd gotten in to talk to the class back then. You live on wave fronts. You live on a station, you ride the local wave, the time you know. You go somewhere else, it's a different wave. Maybe a whole set of waves coming from different places, different times. There's an information wave. There's fads. There's goods. There's ideas. They propagate at different rates. Some dumb kid had made a joke about propagation. The merchanter had said, dead sober, so do stationers. Some shouldn't. And there'd been the scary two beats of hostile quiet and an upset teacher, because that was what deep spacers were notorious for on station call, and what stationers were fools to do, especially with deep spacers, who moved on and didn't care. Corey's mother had, and look what came of it, a girl who'd made up her mind that Mars was irrelevant who said that Rab was irrelevant. Corey had used to say, The Rab can't really change anything. They can't build. They're saying reform Earth politics. But it won't work. Worlds are sinks. They're pits where people learn little narrow ideas. Luna Base was a mistake. Mars Base was. Once we'd got off Earth, we shouldn't ever have sunk another penny in a gravity well. Corey had said, more than once, I'd rather a minor ship for the rest of my life than be stuck on a planet. He focused on the mirror where it wasn't way out's cabin. It wasn't Corey's face he was seeing, and the thin, shadow-eyed stranger who got out of the chair looked like someone who might have a knife in his boot. He wasn't sure Corey would recognize him. He wasn't sure Corey would ever have liked him if she'd met him like this. Serious Rab! Meg said, with a hand on his shoulder. She looked past his shoulders into the mirror, red hair, glitter, and all. Sal was at his other side. He stared at the reflection, thinking, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. This is who survived the wreck. It's somebody Corey wouldn't even want to know. But it's who is, now. And he doesn't think the way he used to. He's not going your direction anymore, Corey. He can't. I've seen crazy people. Faces like statues. They just stare like that. People leave them alone. He looks scared. He doesn't look scared, does he? But he is, Corey. God, he is. Chapter 13 He'd spent money he didn't want to spend, that sliced deep into all he had to live on for the next sixty days. He had Meg on one arm and Sal on the other, both telling him he looked fine, and maybe he did, but he wasn't sure his legs would hold him. Wasn't sure he wasn't going to fall in a faint. 
The white noise of the deck, the echoes, the crashes, rang around, rang around his skull and left him navigating blind. Sal kept, a, bleh. Sal kept a tight grip on his left arm, Meg on the right, Sal saying in the general echoing racket that he looked severely done, and Meg that they shouldn't have pushed him so hard. We can stop in and get a bite, Meg said. I just want to get home, he said. They had his packages. They kept him on his feet. He had no idea where he was, and he looked at a company cop just standing by a storefront, remembering the cop that had stopped him outside the hospital. The fact he was weaving. A fall now, and they'd have him back in hospital, with Pran shooting him full of trank and telling him he was crazy. God, he wanted his room and, the, and his bed. He wanted not to have been the fool he'd been, go he'd been going with these people. He wanted not to have spent any money, and when he finally saw familiar territory and saw the hole's flashing sign, he could only think of getting through the door and through the bar and through the back door. That was all he asked. It was dimmer inside. Light was fuzzing and unfuzzing as he walked, only trying to remember what pocket he'd put his key in, and praying God he hadn't left it in the coveralls back at the shop. But Bird and Ben were sitting at the table they'd had at breakfast, right by the back door. Meg and Sal steered him around to their inspection, and Ben looked him up and down as if he'd seen something oozing across the floor. Well, Bird said, sit down, Dick. I'm just going back to my room. His room it is now, Ben said, and Meg, with a death grip on his arm. Ease off! Man's severely worn down. He's been shopping. Yeah, Ben pulled a chair back. Looks as if. Sit down, Decker. His knees were going. But Ben suddenly took as civil a tone as Ben had ever you what <clears throat> His knees were going, but Ben suddenly took as civil a tone as Ben had ever used with him. Walking out on him didn't seem a good idea, and he was afraid to turn down their overtures, for whatever they were worth. There damned sure weren't any others. He sank into the offered chair. Meg and Sal pulled up a couple of others, and he gave up defending himself. If they wanted something, all right, anything. Ben would only beat hell out of him, that was all, and Ben didn't look as if he was going to do that immediately, for whatever reasons. The owner, Mike, came over to get his drink order. Bird and Ben were eating supper, and he should do the same, but it was already too late. He couldn't get up and stand in the line over there, and he wasn't sure his stomach could handle the grease and heavy spices right now. He remembered the chips. He said, Beer and chips. Out of chips. Pretzels. Yeah, he said. Thanks. Pretzels is fine. Maybe pretzels were a little more like food. He had no idea. And beer was more like food than rum was. Anything at this point. God. That all you're gonna eat? Bird asked. Ben nudged him in the ribs and said, Must be flush today. Who's buying the pretzels, Decker? Meg said, He's off, Ben. He's seriously zed. That's nothing new, Ben said, and Bird. Ben, I just asked who's buying the pretzels. I am, said Decker. If you want any, speak up and say please. Ben whistled, raised a mock defense. Oh, well now, yeah, don't mind if I do. God, you're touchy. He'd have come off the chair and gone for Ben under better circumstances. He didn't have it. It wasn't smart. But something took over him. Wow. But something took over then and made him say, with a set of his jaw, I didn't hear please. Oh, please. An airy wave of Ben's hand. Passing charity around, are we now? Paying off our debts? Did finance come in? Not yet, but it will. You want my card? He pulled it out of his pocket, tossed it onto the table. Go check it out, Pollard. Take whatever you think I owe you. Ben looked at him, and Bird turned his head and called out, Mike, get those beers right over here. Ben's had his foot in his mouth. Excuse him, son. You want to get the pretzels, we'll get the drinks. I'll pay my own tab, he said. 
too harshly. He was dizzy. He wished the drinks would hurry. He wished he was safe in his room, and he wished he knew how to get there before he got into it with Ben. Mistake, he told himself. Serious mistake. We mentioned to him about the board time, Meg said. He says he wants to think about it. What think, Ben said. He's got no bloody choice. Ben, Sal said, sounding exasperated. Shut up. Well, there isn't. Ben was quieter, scowling. Try to help a guy. Ben, Bird said. We're buying his effing drink. Ben, Meg said, and slammed her palm on the table. Bang, a hand with massive rings on each finger. We talked about the lease, and the Jeune Fee is thinking it over. That's his privilege. Meanwhile, he's offered to pay his own tab, all right? So don't cop. Don't pay him any mind, Deck. Sometimes you seriously got to translate, Ben. He means to say, Tresbon, you're on your legs again, and mercy ever so for the pretzels. Uh, incidentally, that is read as written. It does not say très bon, even though they do do the French jeune fille. Uh, it is T-R-E-Z, très bon. And instead of merci, it is mercy, M-E-R-C-Y. So, I'm not mixing up my reading of the French. Thank you very much. <laughs> this time. <laughs> Sorry for the digression. Hmm. Little water here. The beer and pretzels came. Deck picked his card off the table and shoved it at Mike, said, Put it all on mine, and tried not to think what his account must look like now. Bird said, You don't have to do that, son. It's fine, he said. He picked up his beer and felt Ben's hand land heavily on his shoulder, the way Ben had done on the ship when Ben was threatening to kill him. Ben squeezed his shoulder, leaned close to touch glasses with him. No hard feelings, Ben said. He didn't trust Ben any further than he could see both his hands. His stomach was upset. He was all but shaking as was and the glass Ben had touched the rim of suddenly seemed like poison to him, but he sat still and took the requisite polite sip of his beer. Ben said, So, do you want the board time? He looked at Bird, asking without saying anything whether this was Bird's idea, too. Bird didn't deny it. Yeah, he said. So there's strings to be pulled. Ben said. Short as the time is, we have to expedite, as is, or you won't get the ops test before we're out of here. And if you don't do those forms right, you're, they're not going through. Now, as happens, I know the people you need. You do the work in the shop. What work? Thought you'd talk to him, Bird said. I said we'd mentioned it, Meg said. We didn't exactly get down to that point. Well, now we have. Ben said. There's no other way to do it, deck boy. Only deal going. So you've agreed. We're wanting to hear how you're going to pay for it. Time or money or the pleasure of all your company. They were coming at him from all sides. He wasn't sure there was a... He wasn't... Sh okay. <laughs> he wasn't sure there wasn't a moment missing there. His ears were ringing. They were all looking at him, Ben with his hand on his chair back. He lost things. The meds, the meds said he did. And he sat there surrounded by these people who as good as had a gun to his head. If they helped him, he might have a chance. But if they figured out he did forget things, the word would get around, and it was all over. He'd never get reinstated. He'd end up doing refinery work. You any good as a mechanic? Bird asked. I kept way out working. As a pilot? I was good. He didn't expect Bird would believe him. He added self-consciously, We weren't broke. Bird had seemed the best of them. Bird had kept him alive and argued for him with these people. He was desperate for Bird to take his side now. And if they robbed him, there were worse alternatives. Corey and I had 47k in the bank, not counting the ship free and clear. R1 Bank's sending it, but I can't draw on it for another 50, 60 days. 47K, Ben jeered. Come on, Decker. 
he didn't look at Ben. He looked at Bird and Sal, clasped his hands around the wet chill of the beer glass. Corey's mom was pretty well set. Corey had her own account, trust funds. The hour she turned eighteen, she took it, and she called me and bought my ticket and hers. She came out from Mars, I came from Saul. We met out, we met out here, and we bought the ship. Paid a hundred fifty-eight k for her, another forty in parts. We made a few, we made a few mistakes. We hadn't made many runs, only been out here two years. But Corey knew what she was doing. She nearly had her degree in belt dynamics. Twenty-eight of that forty-seven k we didn't have when we came out here. We were doing pretty well. Damned well. Bird said. College girl, Ben said. Come on, the company'd have snapped her up. She didn't admit to it. She didn't want a company slot. With that kind of money, she was a fool. Ben, Bird said. Well, she was. He set his jaw, made himself patient. She just didn't want it. The fact is, she wanted a share in a starship. Oh, for God's sake, Ben said. She wanted into the merchanters. You have to buy in. Her trust fund wasn't enough. Wasn't enough for both of us. And she had this idea. It was all she'd listened to. Why? Sal leaned forward, chin on clasped, many ringed hands, neon sparking fire on her metal beaded braids. Why, if she was rich? Because was all the answer he could manage. There was a knot in his throat, and he thought if Ben opened his mouth, he'd lose it. Corey had been so damned private. Corey didn't tell people her reasons. But they went on listening, waiting for him. So he shrugged and said, Because she hated planets. Because her father was a deep spacer. Her mother wanted a kid, she didn't want a husband, and she didn't want anybody in Mars base to have that kind of claim on Corey. Corey was a solo project. Corey was her mother's doing. Start to... Finish. That word wouldn't come out. He said, watching condensation trickle on the beer glass, didn't even know her name, didn't even know his name. Corey sort of built on her own ideas. Stars were all she talked about. Wanted to do tech training. Her mother wouldn't have it, so she studied astrophysics. She had the whole thing planned. Getting the money, coming out here getting us both out. Ben said, quietly, Hell, if she could buy a ship, she could have gotten it faster working for the company. What's the rate? Eighty, ninety thou to get your tax debt bought? And her mother there, he thought, her mother on Mars Corp board to pull strings, get her broke and get her back. But he didn't say that. He said, They'd have drafted me if I'd stayed at Saul. That was part of her reason. We were going together. That was the plan. That crazy about you, was she? Ben, Meg said, shut up. I don't know why everybody's telling me to shut up. It wasn't the damn brightest thing she could have done. She could have gotten to Saul Station, probably bought straight into a ship with what she had. She expected to make it rich here free-running. Her mother, he said, wanted Corey back in college. Wanted God only. His stomach hurt. He had a sip of the beer to make his throat work. She was under age. Couldn't get an exit visa over her mother's objection. This was as far as she could get. Till she was twenty-one. The ship and the forty-seven K in the bank, Ben began. What do those sons of bitches want for a buy-in anyway? Maybe a couple of hundred k apiece. With the ship, we had it for one of us. Tax debt to get the tax debt to get the visa. You've got to pay that off to the government before you ever get down to paying the ship share. And Corey's was high. She had a degree. Another seventy k each to get back to Saul. I told her to get out. I saw on our first run it was no good. We didn't know how hard it was out here. We wouldn't have done it this way. But by then we'd sunk so much into the ship, and just buying passage to Saul would eat up everything we had. He'd yelled at her the night before their last run. He'd said, the war's getting crazier. They've got these damn exit charges. God knows when they're going to jack them higher. 
If you don't go now, there's no telling what they'll do next. There's no guarantee you can get out. Whoops. There's no guarantee you can get out. Get is italicized, not can. My sorry. My whatever. You know what I mean. He'd begged, just leave me what's left over. I'll buy in on some other ship, work a few years. Whatever ship you're on will come back here. I'll join you then. He'd been lying about the last. She'd known he was. She'd known he didn't want to go. And she'd known he was right, that both of them weren't going to make it. She'd known she was going alone, sooner or later, or they were going to do what every freerunner ultimately did do. Go into debt. That was why the shouting. That was why she'd burst into tears. And she said? Meg asked. He'd lost the thread. He blinked at Meg, confused. He honestly couldn't remember what he'd been telling them. He picked a pretzel out of the bowl, ate it without looking at them, or answering. Bird said, The lad's tired. Yeah, he said, remembered that he was behind on his medicine, remembered that the company management were all sons of bitches, and they were the ones that handed out the licenses. Even that was in their hands. Bird reached out, thumped a grease-edged fingernail against his mug. Want another round? A beer? On us? To sleep on? You're right, he said. I'm pretty tired. He thought about his room. He thought about the bed and the medicine he was supposed to take. All those sleeping pills. Meg hung a hand or <laughs> Meg hung a hand on his right shoulder, leaned close and said, We better get you to bed. He couldn't answer. He shoved her hand off and got up and left. Man's in severe pain, Meg said under her breath, looking over her shoulder. Looked all right to me, Ben said. Looked perfectly fine, out spending money like there was no tomorrow. She muttered, yeah, add it up, Ben. Add it up. Across the table, Bird looked mad. She figured Bird had somewhat to say, and she shut up for several sips of beer. Bird didn't say anything. Ben set his elbows on the table, in an attitude that said he knew he was on Bird's bad side, but he looked mad, too. Things were going to hell fast, they were. "'Excuse us,' she said, and got up and took a pinch of Sal's sleeve. Sal read a full-scale alert, and came with her over to the end of the bar where the guys couldn't lip-read. "'Abajib, we got a severe problem.' "'Yeah, men.' Easy, easy. We got a partner partner problem developing here. You know Ben's a good lay, but he's being a lizard. I sincerely wasn't going to say that. I don't mind saying it. I'll bust his ass if Bird doesn't. I told Ben what I'd carve off him if he got too forward with me, and Bird damn sure won't take it. Bird can handle him. Yeah, Sal said, and got a breath. With a wrench? I tell you, I'm not putting up with this act, I'm not, and I'm not standing in the fire zone either. I vote we go out to a show, leave the boys to one room. Sometimes Sal made real good sense. Yeah, Meg said, sounds good. I got a serious concern, Bird said. Yeah, well, Ben said, looking at the table. Sorry about that, Bird. Why'd you push on him? Hell if I know, Ben said, and didn't know, actually. Meg and Sal came back to say they were leaving. You guys work it out, Sal said, and that made him madder. He watched them walk out. He had no notion where they were going, but he felt like but he felt the ice on all sides of him. 
I don't know what the hell it is, he said, without really looking at Bird. I don't know what it is the guy's got, but it seems to get in the way of people's good sense. He hadn't liked this partner's idea. Oh, yes. Okay, very good. He hadn't liked this partner's idea from the time Sal had showed up at the three-deck shop telling him how dealing with Decker was going to set them all up rich, how it was such a good idea, Decker her getting his license back and all, and he'd liked it less than that when... And he'd liked it less than that when Pretty Boy came sauntering in here all manicured and looking like trouble. Bird didn't say anything for a while after that. Finally... Maybe some people can't figure out why you got it in for him. Because he's crazy, Ben said. Because we're going to take this loony out there where he can get his ship back, cut the girls' throats, and run that ship back over the line. You've been seeing those lurid vids again. What in hell's he going to say about two more missing persons over at R1? Oh, excuse me, they took a walk together. He doesn't have to have a good excuse. He's crazy. Crazy people don't have reasons for what they do. That's why they're crazy. They still have to explain it to belt management. It doesn't do Meg and Sal any fucking good. My money'd be on Meg and Sal. Don't be funny, bird. It's not funny. I think it's damn funny. We got a 95k mortgage on way out with the bank. We got nothing but dock charges on Trinidad for the last several months. We are st we still aren't past inspection on the refit, and we still got a filing to go before we can think about getting out of here. In case you haven't noticed, Ben, me lad, we could seriously use another pair of hands here. We're bleeding money with two ships sitting at dock. Meg and Sal do just fine. We don't know about this guy, and we'd have had two pairs of hands today if Meg and Sal weren't out spending money on this guy. He's trouble, Bird. He's been trouble from the first we laid eyes on him. We can always say no if he turns out to be trouble. We got time yet at least to find it out. Let's just put him to work, see how he gets along. You can't say no, Bird. You got this severe problem with saying no. You crawl ass backwards into what's going to cost you money. If I didn't, I can say no real good, Ben, if you recall. I said no to Meg, and I said no to quite a few would-bes before I took you on. Now, you and me being partners, I give you a lot I wouldn't give just anybody. But being partners goes both ways. And right now, I'm asking you to give me a little more line. To do what? Wait until his money comes through? Then he'll pay for his own bills? That's real convenient, Bird. That's real damn convenient. He doesn't get to pay anything. He doesn't do anything. And we're buying his meals. Ben? I don't know why you believe him over me, that's all. Ben... I don't know whether the gals are right about this deal. They could be. Here I am trying to figure whether I trust Decker, and you're acting so damn crazy I end up defending him. I can't hardly take your side without having him off down the deck in a fit, now can I? It'd be good riddance. Yeah, and what if the gals are right and this guy's a good steady prospect? Steady hell! Bird, who are we going to go out who are we going to go... Wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, who are we going to get to go out with Decker? Oh my gosh, there are so many Gs. Golly. Steady hell. Bird, who are we going to get to go out with Decker? What time is it? What time is it? Who's going to put up with that? The guy really got to you out there, didn't he? He hated being patronized. He didn't get to me. Good, Bird said. Good. Damn it, don't... Don't what? Cut me off like that, Ben thought blackly. But what he said was, All right, all right. We'll see how he does the next week or so. He took a pretzel out of the bowl. Guy didn't take him. Wasteful habit. It was like somebody who had money, who was used to having it. And the, 
and on the thought of the 47k Decker claimed to have, if he's got funds, he if he's got the funds he claims, he's a damned walking bank. Where'd he get it except this rich college girl? He had a lot to gain by her dying, you know. Yeah, looked like he was having a real good time out there, didn't it? He hated it when Bird got surly with him. It made him figure maybe he wasn't being reasonable. Bird said, The Nori thing, you know, changed a lot. Cops with warrants to do anything they wanted. The news full of friends informing on friends. I don't think there was half of the... I don't think there was half the under-the-table stuff going on that the company claimed. Like we were some major leak in the company accounts. We weren't. We were making it. You understand? People used to help each other. That's what was going on then. If you got in trouble and you needed a pot, you didn't go to the bank. You went to a friend. You could borrow under the bank rates. If you kept your promises, if you ran a good operation and paid your debts... And damn sure people knew if you did. We were making it, and the company wasn't. Now you tell me who's the better businessman. Bird lifted a shoulder and took a sip of a dying beer. Now we've got a generation coming off Earth with the attitudes. We got a generation coming out of the Institute that never heard of Shakespeare. God, so give me a tape, Bird. I swear I'll listen to this bitch. Bird looked at him oddly, then reached across the table, took hold of his hand, man-woman-like, which was odder still, scarily odd, coming from Bird, from the guy he shared a ship with. Bird said, Ben, you're a good guy. You really are. Stay that way. Ben rescued his hand, shaken. What's that mean? Bird only said, in that same peculiar way, Ben, me lad, I'll look you up that tape. Decker stared at the ceiling and thought about a sleeping pill. <laughs> and thought about a sleeping pill. Thought about the whole damn bottle but hell if he'd give the company the satisfaction. Ben wasn't going to let him alone. That was the way it was, and was the way it was going to be. Ben didn't like him, and with Belters, that well could be the final word on it. Ben had taken his ship, and now Ben had him down as trouble. That was the way it was going to be, too. He didn't know why Ben set him off like that, he didn't know why he'd said what he had. He didn't know why he'd talked about Corey's business, or whether he had a chance left with them. Under any terms now, he'd walked out. And he didn't know what Bird might be thinking. If nothing else, that he and Ben together were a problem. He had no question which way Bird would go if Ben wanted him out. And Ben talked about getting his license back, with no dollar figure on it. Everything he had, he was sure if they still took him after the blow-up out there. Ben thought he was crazy. Ben thought he'd crack if he got out there again. And, honestly speaking, he wasn't sure of himself. The deep belt was no place to discover you'd grown scared of the dark, and handling a ship making a tag was no time to have a memory lapse, to find the next move wasn't there, or not to remember where you were in a sequence, or what you'd already done. You didn't get other chances. The belt didn't give them. He didn't know himself what would happen when the hatch shut behind him, whether he'd panic, whether he'd be all right, whether he'd think he was all right, and, the longer he was out in that ship, slowly unravel between past and present, the way he had in the shower. That shower, the same surroundings, nothing but his current partner's presence to anchor him in time. Everybody seemed to be asking him to collect himself, get on with his life as if nothing had happened. It seemed to be the way everybody got by. They numbed themselves to, the fe to feeling, made themselves deaf and blind to what the company got away with, just kept their mouths shut, chased what money they could get, and got used to seeing a lying son of a bitch in the mirror every morning, because that was the only kind that had a chance in this place. He didn't know whether he could do that. 
He didn't even know whether he could keep out of that pill drawer and stay alive tonight, or whether the gain was even worth it anymore. Corey, he'd said that time they'd had the or argument. Maybe I don't want to go. What in hell am I going to do on a starship? I failed math. I failed physics. I don't have your brains, Corey. It was all your idea all along. They don't have what works. They won't have what work. Wow. They won't have work for me. I'll be dead mass the rest of my life, Corey. What kind of life is that? She'd set him down, told him plain as plain he hadn't any chance in staying. She'd told him the company was crooked. The company was screwing the free runners, screwing the pilots, screwing everybody that worked for them. Corey had handled big money. She knew... That one was a bogus call. The other one was not. I thought it was them calling back, because I was like, ah, give me an hour. Corey had handled big money. She knew how banks worked with the, uh, with the big operations. She'd told him what Aztecs was doing with their electronic data cards and their policies on fines. She'd tried to explain to him exactly what that direct deduct stuff on LOSs did to accounts and interest, and how they were skimming on the free runners in ways that had nothing to do with rocks. She'd said, Deck, don't be a fool. You've no future here. They're killing the free runners. They'll get to the sh they'll get the shepherds in not too many years. There's no hope here. She said, Don't ever think I'll leave you behind. Sal sipped her drink in the blue neon of Scorpios. The vid had been not too bad, chop and slash, the way Meg said, but not a long one, and as she had put it, it was way too early to chance walking in on the boys, besides which she had a, she had a word to drop on some friends next door. It was her favorite lounge, Shepherd Territory, right next to the Association Club. Pricey. Spiff. You got the usual traffic of office types who went anywhere au courant, on the edge of Helltech, but the Shepherd relationship with Scorpios was long-standing. Shepherds got the tables in the nook past the glass pillars, and Shepherd glasses came filled to the brim, no shorting and no extra water either. Not a place they could afford as a steady habit, damn sure, not unless they'd picked up some guys with Shepherd-level finance, and they weren't shopping to do that this time. No danger of walk-up offers this side of those pillars either, thank God. The women-to-men ratio on Helldeck meant shepherds were used to being courted, not the other way around, and two women who weren't signaling didn't get the pests that made sane conversation impossible in a lot of the cheaper bars. God, you got them in restaurants, in vid-show doorways. This shift some R&R bunch was in from the shipyard, and the soldier boys on leave down at the vid were the damn all worst. They'd had a glut of male fools for the last few hours, and Scorpio's was a refuge worth the tab, in her own considered opinion. I tell ya, she said over an absolutely genuine marguerite. I assume that's a margarita without the A. My instinct would be to take... Whoops. Oh, this is Sal. Wrong character. I tell ya, she said over an absolutely genuine marguerite. My instinct would be to take this deck a tour before we go out. You know, personal, just friendly. Rattle them and see what shakes. I think that's a serious safety question. But we got Ben in the gears, damn him. You want my opinion, Abujib? Possessive? Virgin, Abujib. You're probably the first that ever asked him. Hell, he's that way with Bird. Yeah. She saw what Meg was saying then. That way about a lot of things, isn't he? Meg stirred her drink with the little plastic straw. Man's got a serious problem. Hasn't cost us yet, but it's to worry about. Michael Turney, what he pulled on Bird tonight. Oh, chin, Sal agreed, with an uncomfortable twitch of her shoulders, sipping her marguerite, thinking how they weren't doing as 
ordinaire with Ben, how if it was anybody else but the best numbers man on R2, she'd have handed him off... Yes, okay, no. Just a long sentence and it's chopped up funny. Very good. Oh, Chin, Sal agreed with an uncomfortable twitch of her shoulders, sipping her marguerite, thinking how they weren't d doing as ordinaire with Ben. How if it was anybody else but the best numbers man on R2, she'd have handed him off to Meg. Switch and dump, the old disconnection technique. But, damn it, Ben was special, the absolute best, and Meg with Ben didn't do them any good. Meg didn't know the right questions, and she didn't do the calc as well. Besides, it wasn't Meg who made Ben crazy enough to show her things the Institute hadn't, that he'd figured, that he wouldn't hand out to anybody. She'd never met a case like Ben. You felt simpatico with him one minute, and the next you wanted to break his neck. She'd never bet anybody she trusted the way she did Ben, except Meg and Bird. Ben was the only one but Meg and Bird she'd feel safe going EV with, and, counting his crazy behavior, she couldn't figure that out. At least he wasn't like the greasy sumbitch who'd threaten not to let her back in the ship unless she did him special favors. Numbers men were always at a disadvantage, always got the problems until you were as good as Ben, that nobody wanted to lose. That nobody wanted to lose. Meg had never been through that particular trouble. A numbers man didn't dare antagonize his pilot, if he had any sense, and he didn't send his pilot walkabout either. But a numbers man definitely could get out with some severely strange people in this business, and if you had some few partners you were sure of, you didn't let them go. Didn't try to run their lives for them, not if you wanted to get all your fingers back, but hell, if... But hell, if you wouldn't go to any length to hold on to them, to keep things the way they were. Kill somebody? If it came to it, if you ever would, then you would. And trying to keep two tallish young guys from killing each other out there... What are we going to do, Katie? Meg pursed her lips. Just what we're doing. Let Bird handle it. Someone brushed by their table touched her shoulder. Abajib? God, a walk-up? Meg's frown was instant. Sal looked around, and... Whoop. Sal looked around and up an expensive jacket at a shepherd, one of Sunderland's crew, friend of Mitch's. She didn't know the name. She said, very quickly, slipping something into her pocket, That question you left? Oh, that question you left? Yeah? she said. Different problem. Same problem. She held her breath. Felt something flat and round and plastic in her pocket, her heart going double time. This is Katie. Yeah, she said. You can say. Where it is, problem's gone, Major. You're tagged with it. Go with it the way you said. Time's welcome. But when you get your launch date, you let us know. Very seriously. The guy walked off then. God. What the hell? Meg asked. I dunno, she said, thinking about a shadowy driver sitting out there spitting chunks at the well. And Mom Bitch, who prepared the charts and their courses, and shoved them up to V and break them. I dunno. Her stomach felt, of a sudden, as if she'd swallowed something very cold. Is that what I think I heard? Meg asked. They think we could be in some kind of danger? I don't know. Oh, God, great. Let's not panic. Of course let's not panic. I don't effin like the stakes all of a sudden. She leaned forward on the table, pitched her voice as low as would ca still carry. Meg, they're not going to let us run into trouble. Yeah, Meg whispered back. Let's not hear run into... I don't like the words I'm hearing. I don't like this go with it. Maybe I want a little more information than we're getting into. They're saying we're doing the right thing. Yeah, doing the right thing. We can be fucking martyrs out there. Is that what they want? She reached across the table and grabbed Meg's hand, scared Meg would bolt on her. We got a real chance here. What real chance? Chance your high and mighty friends are gonna hold us a nice funeral? Chance we can collect a karma and they stay clean? Meg, I can get you in. Screw that. 
Meg jerked her hand back. I don't take their charity. Meg, for God's sake, don't blow it. Meg set her jaw, took several slow breaths, the way she would when she was mad. What's their guarantee? Shit, we could be bugged here. Sal took the flat plastic of her out of her coat pocket, which had a little green light showing, palmed it fast. God, Meg groaned. They're ahead of the game. They are not going to let us walk into it. Oh, you've got a lot of faith in them. That's contraband, damn it. Meg, they're not fools. They must think we are. They made us an offer, Meg. They're saying they're agreeing. They're warning us. Yeah, tagged with him. I like that. I really like that. Meg. She couldn't lay it out better than Meg already knew it. Meg looked like murder. But Meg said finally, We're tagged with him. Are we talking about giving up that lease? The answer was yes. Meg knew it. Meg knew it upside and down. Shit, Meg said. We've got what they want. They want him. They paid their debts. That's what they're saying. They're asking us to take a risk, and we're in, Meg. They're making us an offer. If we screw them on this, or if we back out now... She was down to begging. There were pulls in too many directions if Meg skidded out on this one. God, everything she wanted. Everything. A shepherd birth, Meg. One last run. We get Deck out in the big quiet for a few months, and that's it. Ben and Bird set up with those ships. Karma paid. We're getting out of here, Meg. A chance at a real ship. Both of us. That scored with Meg. Only thing that could. Meg's face got madder. Finally, Meg said, Hell if. Wake up. Up, Abujib. Hell if not. This is big, Meg, damn it. This is it. Meg shook her head, but it meant yes. All right, we're going to be fools. You better be right, Abujib. And that June Fee damn well better get his bearings. Fast. If they're going to make a case on him, he sincerely better not be crazy. And I am going to have to call it there. Thank you all for tuning in. We're about three quarters of the way through the book. Uh, things are going to get rolling in a big way. There's lots of allusion as to what the hell's going on. Uh, things will be made clearer. Uh, I'm not sure if there's ever a big sit down explaining exactly what's going on. Uh, but you pick up enough so that it makes sense, at least. Um, I do do this every week. Uh, every Friday is Free Read Fridays, where I read short stories and indeed entire novels aloud. Uh, right now we're about three quarters of the way through Heavy Time by C.J. Cherry. Um, but yeah, I do this every week at noon Eastern Standard Time, roughly. Sometimes I'm a couple of minutes late. Um, I also do other streams throughout the week. I've got a Mecha Mondays stream, where I do something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent. Uh, right now, I'm doing a run-through of the old PS1 game that now has an actual fan English fan patch uh, called Remote Control Dandy. If you ever played Robot Alchemic Drive on the PS2, this is its uh, spiritual grandparent. Um, I also do a Warframe Wednesday stream where I do Warframe for a couple hours because I'd been with Warframe basically since the jump, and uh, I needed something popular to get views and, well... <laughs> it's all about tweaking those algos in your favor, and that means knowing people, doesn't it? Um, I may wind up changing Katie's voice because, like, I think it'd be more appropriate to have a more Irish accent. But um, it's pr it's too late now, so I'll just grin and bear it. Uh, yeah. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, don't let the corp rats get you down. Um. You're probably noticing some overriding thematics that are awfully goddamn familiar for the modern era. Uh, sorry, it's not me making a specific political stance in reading it. Um, I should, 
I've considered putting up a warning that like whatever is said in these books is the views of the characters contained within them, not the author or myself. But like, if people don't get that, then I, I sigh, like sighing is it's, it's like this mouse thing. <laughs> and if, if you know what I'm talking about, um, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, well, apparently teaching people, allow, allowing kids to read about the Holocaust using uh, animals such as mice um, is apparently a no-go for some people. Um, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, I have some strong opinions on that, but I'm not going to go there. Mostly because I have opinions on uh, keeping people from reading certain books. Listen, I'm the kind of guy who's going to be even like, hey, you know, if you want to read The Fountainhead or, or Atlas Shrugged or anything by Ayn Rand, you should go ahead. But Ayn Rand's kind of a nut. Um, <laughs> so, yes. And with that, I've probably lost some people and I apologize. Not a big fan. Not a big fan. We're allowed to like things and not like things, I think. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, basic game plan is uh, I'll get through heavy time. Uh, I'll probably do some short stories. Probably some pulpy stuff because I've got a nice archive of that I'm working through. Uh, and then probably get right on to he uh, Hellburner, which is a direct sequel to Heavy Time. Um, you will recognize the faces. It involves much of the uh, previous cast. I don't think all of them. I think some of them aren't present, but most everybody's involved. So get excited for that. Um, CJ Cherry is... I'm, I'm very passionate about CJ Cherry's work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, she's different. She's different. Like, the closest author I'd compare her to, uh, in my experience, would probably be, like, Frank Herbert. Uh and that's not fair to either of them because they're both very different from each other. There's like reading Cytine, it's really hard not to come to like Frank Herbert comparisons because of the level of insane background world building detail that has been a very obviously done. <laughs> like it's really painfully obvious how much world building work went into it. Um, if you can't enjoy Dune for any other reason, enjoy it for being an insane exercise in world building. Maybe not quite up to, um, like, Lord of the Rings, which is still probably the most world building -y word world building series ever. It's like I, I I have yet to encounter one that is quite encounter anything that anything that's quite as nutty as that winds up being, and I learn new things about how how granular uh, <laughs> J.R.R. Tolkien's um, process was for making those. Like, every year I learn something new, and I'm just like, my god, this guy, <laughs> we did not deserve what he did. <laughs> I'm not promising that I'll read the Lord of the Rings series aloud here, but I'm also not saying I won't. Oh, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it eventually. Uh, other authors I'd really like to get around to reading on this uh, are Jeff Vandermeer. I really want to read something of his out loud here. Because uh, he's interesting. He's He's got a very... I like his prose style. Um, or I find his prose style interesting, anyway. Um, I haven't decided what I'll do for that. Um, I may want to get some Alistair Reynolds read. I don't know. Um, people who've been with me a long time know that I've got a very soft spot for Greg Egan, and I have plenty more Greg Egan to read uh, aloud. I keep meaning to check if he's done anything in the last year or two, and I haven't done it. Alrighty, that's rambling enough from me. Uh, I'll see you all later. Stay toasty, stay sane. Um, read books or get people to read them to you. Don't feel bad. Like, I think books are important. And that's why I'm doing this. And if you enjoy stories, good. I also urge you to, rec I urge you to check out any of the books I've read aloud, if you've never done. Um, 
because particularly CJ Cherry, particularly CJ Cherry's works, uh, they are not easy to read aloud, um, but they're brilliant. Most of them. There has been some stuff she's written that I wasn't hugely fond of, but that's few and far between. Alrighty, I'm going to school. Have fun and be decent.